Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this session on uh, prevention, care, and treatment of hepatitis B and C in the displaced populations, namely uh, refugees and migrants. And the first uh, presentation will be by uh, Professor Muhammad Ali. And Professor Ali is a pioneer of hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, he initiated the first ever successful liver transplant in Bangladesh. And he's the founder of the uh, National Liver Foundation of Bangladesh. And he's going to speak about the largest refugee population of the Rohingya uh, in Bangladesh, uh, uh, Professor Ali. Welcome everybody to the International Biohepatitis Illumination Meeting 2020. I am Professor Mohammad Ali from National Liver Foundation of Bangladesh. My topic of talk today is hepatitis B and C virus prevention, care, and treatment in displaced population, the largest refugee population, Rohingya in Bangladesh. First, I'd like to say, who are the, those Rohingyas? Rohingyas are the stateless peoples of Myanmar. Their citizenship was ignored in 1982, and they are deprived of all kinds of healthcare facilities. Mass killing and torture was held in August 2017, leading to their forced migration of about 1 million people to, from Rakhine State to Cox Bazar, Bangladesh, and created the largest refugee population of the world. United Nations Human Rights declares as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. The International Court of Justice qualified as genocide of human being. This is the Rakhine state from where these peoples migrated to Cox Bazar, crossing the Naif River, and by different ways, even after crossing the river by walking long distance, and they were settled in this camp, in the Rohingya camp. UNHCR at that time reported about 9 million, but after that it has crossed more than 1 million. What is the problem when they come to Bangladesh? They outnumbered the total population of the localities about threefold. And it is a huge burden for the over, already overpopulated country, Bangladesh. And uh, constraint of food, water, and sanitation, and health risk. And another most important thing, they faced physical violence, sexual violence, while fleeing to Cox Bazar. And there was about 42,000 pregnant women, as reported in 2018. Our Prime Minister visited the camps and assured them for all sorts of uh, support and uh, shelter until they return home. UNHCR it also came forward and different countries of the world came forward to help them by different ways. One of the problem which the topic of the today is the hepatitis B and C among the Rohingya refugees. The National Liver Foundation of Bangladesh came to know that there are about more than 30,000 pregnant women among them. And definitely, as they are staying in the camps, they are in a highly unhealthy and unvulnerable condition. And uh, the childbirth is going on in the home or in the roadside. So or everything is uh, really in an unhygienic condition, inhuman condition. Then we were thinking that, is it possible to screen this hepatitis, screen this pregnant woman for hepatitis B and C? so that those positive of hepatitis B, we can provide immunoglobulin to the uh, newborn to stop the particle transmission. And uh, another thing is to aware them, the family and, and others related to this uh, plan to screen 300 pregnant women then uh, we contacted the local authorities 
and we made the testing on 21 October 2017. And these are the some testing photographs, the uh, hundreds of uh, pregnant women are attending and we distributed the awareness leaflets as well. The result was, it showed that hepatitis C is about 8%, and hepatitis B is 3%, and co-infection was 1%. We conveyed the result to the hosp hospital camp leader, as well as the uh, government health authority, UNFPA in charge, and two individual friendly individuals. I, I presented this in the World Hepatitis Summit at Suabolo, Brazil, on November 2017. And then these are the uh, this is the uh, presentation of World Hepatitis Summit, and it was covered in the uh, electronic and press media, and also reported in the some Observer Research Foundation. In the, they quoted this in their reporting. Also, there was publication in Oxford, and they also quoted this result and showed this concern. Then uh, getting this, we plan to screen more people, about uh, 2,000 people. We contacted the same uh, uh, people for logistics and other supports. And uh, on February 10 to 14, 2019, we, by 10 days, we completed the testing of 2,000 refugees in different camps of, uh, of, of at, and these are the some the the result was it shows that uh, prevalence of hepatitis C is 10.65 percent, and uh, female is affected much more about 26.44 percent having females. And uh, we also informed the government authorities as well as the union centers regarding this uh, incidence of high finding. And uh, there was a research meeting in Malaysia for Rohingya refugees uh, where I presented this uh, finding as well. So we were planning uh, for total management of this uh, uh, hepatitis B and C affected pupils, testing of more people, scale up mass awareness and treatment facilities. But we could not proceed because of so many uh, adverse cities, as well as finally the COVID pandemic. High SCB among uh, Rohingya uh, 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 women, uh, we predict that there was lack of awareness about the viral hepatitis, poor sexual and reproductive health, and unskilled, unskilled traditional birth attendants for conducting the births, and insanitary conditions, sexual violence. And another thing is the year and no speaking. Uh, is a common practice among the women folk. And if you see, look into the, if we look into the uh, scenario of uh, viral hepatitis in this region, hepatitis B is about four to five percent in Bangladesh, and one percent of the kids. And Myanmar, it is twelve point four percent, and two percent having hepatitis C. And uh, but. Uh, it has been seen that uh, uh, the Rohingya population having 10.65% hepatitis uh, C. So it is uh, much higher uh, than uh, and uh, 1 million people having high incidence of hepatitis C is, uh, is, is, uh, is really a uh, burden for uh, uh, the country. First treating report of 300 pregnant women and subsequent report of 2,000 refugees in initial one and just a team cost. And needs cohort study to for treatment uh, and making uh, treatment protocol. And high prevalence of tenfold is host country is a problem. And that it might affect the elimination of 2030 goals of Bangladesh. So it needs a control uh, strategy should be made and needs and well coordinated efforts is needed. In summary, distinguished audience, I like to uh, emphasize this. National and international efforts to be reinforced to return the refugees to their homeland. Scale up of healthcare services of Rohingya refugees, access to reproductive health and child care. International communities must collaborate and have a comprehensive viral hepatitis strategy for these Rohingya refugees 
the largest refugee population of the world. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the global community that realized the importance of hepatitis B and C among Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Thank you, everybody, from Rohingya refugee camps, Koksuraja, Bangladesh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ali, for this uh, great presentation highlighting uh, a very large population with a staggering number of uh, hepatitis B and C infected women. Uh, with uh, and, 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 and the rest of the population, of course, should be screened. And I agree with you that uh, this needs uh, concerted efforts from um, the um, international efforts. Um, and the next uh, speaker will be Professor uh, Ponciano Osama. Uh, from Uganda, Professor of Medicine, Academic Hepatologist at uh, Makiri uh, University College of Health Sciences in Kampala. And uh, he has major research in hepat cell carcinoma uh, uh, in resource limited settings and participated in hepatitis B and C guidelines uh, with WHO. Uh, he will discuss the largest refugee population in Africa, the South Sudanese uh, in Uganda, Professor Osama. So I want to thank the organizers of this conference for uh, allowing me to make this pre presentation on the largest refugee population in Africa, uh, specifically the South Sudanese in Uganda. I have got no disclosures to make uh, for this. Uh, the outline is, we are going to look at the profile of Uganda a little bit for people who do not know Uganda. And then we look at the Uganda and the refugee policy and the focus on uh, BDBD uh, settlement, which is the largest camp in Uganda, and the uh, viral hepatitis B in Uganda and South Sudan. And then we look at a brief uh, survey that we conducted in 2018 in hepatitis B. Uganda is this little country uh, in East Africa, and uh, it borders as, as South Sudan on the north, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo on the west, and then on the south, we have got Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, Tanzania, and on the east, Kenya. I mention this because most of our refugees actually come from uh, DRC and also from South Sudan. Uganda um, has got a, a total surface area of 241 thousand square kilometers and the 41,000 actually is basically swamp and, uh, and water. Total population is 46 million as by this year uh, with a, a fertility rate of five live births per woman and, and then a GDP per capita of $694. Now in Uganda, we have got the third largest refugee population in the world. It hosts, we host actually about 1.4 million refugees, most of whom are from South Sudan. And the reason is uh, why we have all this huge number is because of the surrounding areas. Many of the countries surrounding us have been undergoing conflicts. And also the country has got very favorable refugee policy. For example, a new uh, refugee coming into the country who has been screened and allocated a settlement uh, is given a plot of land for the livelihood and is free to move around and has got ability uh, to run even businesses. Some of them run large businesses in Uganda. In, in terms of the country of origin of these refugees, South Sudan, of course, forms the largest. Uh, we have 885,000 refugees from South Sudan followed by the Democratic Republic of Congo, 418,000. And then we have other countries, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, Eritrea, Sudan, Ethiopia, and all these contribute to the refugee population in this country. And that is by, by October, uh, end of October this year. Now you can see from this map that most of the refugees in Uganda actually around this area, which is in the northwestern region of, of Uganda, called also the West Nile region. And the, the little uh, triangles here are the settlements, and the little huts are basically the, the, the screening centers. The big blue circles are really representing Sudanese in these different settlements. 
in the country. And so most refugees in the country is actually found in that uh, northwestern part of Uganda. In terms of the district of origin, uh, district of uh, location of these um, refugee camps, we have got uh, Yumbe. Yumbe has got the biggest refugee camp, which is the Bilibili camp that I am going to talk about a little bit. And um, but the others are Jumani, Madio, Kolo, and Terego. All these are in the in the um, northwestern part of Uganda. The rest of the country has got uh, camps, but they are not as big as the ones that we have in northern uh, northwestern Uganda. Now, this in the red the red um, map here is actually representing the Bidibidi camp. and it is the largest camp in this country. It has uh, it is in Yumbe district. It covers uh, 250 square kilometers. It is home to over 230,000 refugees and uh, most of them are refugees. Now, about hepatitis B, in Uganda, we've had uh, two surveys. Uh, one survey was that what, which was conducted in 2004, which placed Uganda uh, to have 10% as a population with hepatitis B. But uh, in 2019, we had another survey, which now has 4.1% of the of Ugandans having um, hepatitis B. Uh, this distribution, however, varies from region to region. And you can see in this uh, that most, there is a north-south uh, gradient with the northern part of Uganda having the highest um, percentage of those with hepatitis B compared to the southern part. And because the northern part also borders South Sudan, the, there is a belt of northern Uganda and South Sudan with a high uh, rate of hepatitis B. In uh, South Sudan, there was a report in the year 2007 that showed 29% of pregnant women had uh, hepatitis B. Another report mentioned that uh, over, over half of the mothers who were actually born, of the babies born to surface antigen positive uh, mothers were found to be infected. Again, uh, confirming the high risk of um, early childhood trans uh, transmission of hepatitis. In 2018, we conducted a, a small survey. We recruited the, uh, mothers 15 to 49 years attending antenatal clinics in the in a Bidibidi refugee settlement. And we screened 200 pregnant women for the surface antigen and anti core antibody. What we found was that the mean age was 27 years, 96% of these uh, mothers were married. 85% uh, were housewives, and 84% were of the Nuer tribe. Now, again, for people who may not be knowing, Sudan has got two dominant tribes, the Nuer tribe and the Dinka uh, tribe. Now, the, the Dinka is actually the ruling tribe right now in South Sudan. And the, you can therefore also think that it is possible, it is possible that there is that, uh, you know, conflict between the two tribes which will push the Nuer to move out of South Sudan and eventually end up in Uganda. But the overall prevalence of hepatitis B in the pregnant women we found to be 15.5%. And what are the implications? There is a higher prevalence of hepatitis B in this population than in the host country general population, because we are now talking of 4%. In Uganda, and we're talking about 15% in that population. And so routine screening of pregnant women for hepatitis B would represent a first step towards the prevention of mother-to-child transmission and implementation of birth dose and antiviral therapy for selected mothers. Using e-antigen and viral load testing would be very crucial in this population. So the next steps would be to understand really what is happening in this population. For example, we need to understand the epidemiology and risk factors of HBV among the pregnant women in Uganda and also in the refugee camp. And the reasons for this uh, regional variation uh, where we have a high uh, 
prevalence in the vulnerable population and also in, in, in the different parts of Uganda as well. The best method for care and treatment of persons infected with HBV also needs to be studied. We are trying to study integrating hepatitis B in the uh, existing HIV services within the country, and we hope we, sh we shall be reporting this uh, results also soon in some other conferences. However, all interventions uh, towards HBV infection elimination has got to be aligned with the Ministry of Health strategies for sustainability purposes. So in summary, Uganda houses a huge refugee population. South Sudan is the main supplier. Hepatitis B prevalence is very high among the refugees. And in order to reach elimination targets of WHO, specific strategies need to be adapted. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Ponciano, for highlighting this uh, very important and vulnerable population. Uh, and now we move to the uh, next pre presentation by Professor Jeff uh, Lazarus, uh, who is an associate professor at the Barcelona Institute of Global Health and as well as the Faculty of Medicine, uh, University of Barcelona. He's vice chair of the uh, European Study of Liver Disease International Liver Foundation. And uh, he actually coined the term of microelimination uh, together with the, with the foundation and um, uh, uh, as well as leading efforts uh, in the Global Coalition for uh, The title of his presentation will be uh, Can We Eliminate Viral Hepatitis in Europe? Uh, Professor Lazarus. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for the opportunity to return to IVHEM. I was first here in 2017 when I spoke about the concept of microelimination, and now I'll be speaking about can we eliminate viral hepatitis in migrant populations in Europe? And I'll briefly touch upon the concept of microelimination in that context. So we're well aware of how much hepatitis B and how much hepatitis C is in the world. And we know that B is largely in Asian and African countries and C is largely in parts of Asia and across Europe, including Eastern Europe. What's important here is to note that some 3% of the global population in 2015 alone migrated from many of these countries to many of the high income countries in North America and Europe. So we have a population migrating from countries with hepatitis B and C to European countries. That's what I'm going to address, particularly the unique challenge for host country health systems. The European Center for Disease Control ran a systematic review a few years ago. I won't go through it in detail, but let's take a look at the example of Spain um, on the bottom left. So you'll see the total population, the proportion that is foreign born, but importantly, you'll see the proportion of foreign born from hepatitis endemic countries, in this case, hepatitis B. So you see that around 4% of the Spanish population or over a million people are from countries where hepatitis B is endemic. So in a country like Spain, that's the population you largely have to target in order to eliminate hepatitis B. The next question would be which migrant populations? And on the right, you see some of the studies that informed that ECDC report. So you can start to get an idea of the prevalence. Although the sample sizes are quite small, you can start to get an idea of which countries are contributing to the hepatitis B burden in Spain. And indeed in this ECDC report, you can see that for all of the European countries where data was available. Now, one thing is to understand which countries are the, pop the migrant populations that need to be addressed. The other is the barriers to care for these populations. So despite migrants from high endemic countries living in well-resourced host countries, testing and diagnosis are suboptimal. Health systems barriers limit effective testing and linkage to care for migrant populations. There are language barriers, cultural barriers, structural and legal barriers, a lack of knowledge and understanding both among the migrants but also among many healthcare personnel dealing with the migrant populations. There are cost issues, transportation, and more. So the question at hand is how can we effectively test 
and engage migrant populations in viral hepatitis care. Well, there are many solutions and some of them have been discussed at this meeting more generally. I'll highlight just a few of particular importance for migrant populations. One is point of care testing. That can be a rapid test like you see here on the far left. It can also be a dried blood spot. And here you see the new plasma separation card, which can run serological and molecular um, tests and can last for some 40 days at high temperatures, important in some parts of Europe and particularly important in some of the endemic countries that migrant populations come from. In the middle, you see the importance of culturally sensitive and accessible material. We need to make sure the language is accessible, but also that it's translated into the native language of the migrant population. The role of peer navigators is particularly important. Peer navigators are respected members of the migrant community. They may be um, religious leaders, they may be elders, they may be a medical doctor, whoever it is, you have to identify who your peer navigators can be because they will help provide access um, to that community and help you engage that community in the care, in the testing that is needed. And finally, there's particular importance of community-based interventions and community engagement. We can't impose a viral hepatitis program. We need to discuss it with the community and have them understand why it's important for them. And then we need to discuss on what terms such a program can be implemented. And this may mean, and I'll show you this in an example in a moment, that the services actually need to go to the community rather than asking the community to go to the services themselves, like hospitals and clinics. In general, one of the goals when engaging this population, and I would argue many marginalized populations, is the fewer the visits, the better. In order to test, we want to avoid a single or even multiple venous blood draws. We can use a dried blood spot, so we can have reflex testing, or we can use a rapid detection test right on the site, like with a DBS, but here we would get the results in maybe 15, 20 minutes, or even five minutes, like new data from the OraQuick um, study has shown us. Um, the important issue to consider is how quickly can we move, but also where can we provide these tests and how can we limit the number of visits so it's as simple as possible for the population, for the migrant population that's a part of the particular study. Now, migrant populations will go to many different types of services, and here are some of them listed here. And in some of these services, there'll be a small percentage of the population, which will make it difficult to provide materials um, in their language or to engage with peer navigators. I'm going to focus on the bottom left here on community health centers, because if we go to a community health center for a particular migrant population, we know that the vast majority, if not all of the people there are going to be from that particular population, whether they're from Ghana or Senegal or Russia or China or somewhere else. Let me share this example of a project we just launched in Barcelona Spain. It's a community-based testing and vaccination initiative to link West African migrants to liver specialist care in the greater Barcelona area through the utilization of simplified diagnostic methods and peer supporters or peer navigators. So firstly, our research team at IS Global, the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, where I work, goes to the African community centers and provides an HPV awareness workshop. This is already developed in collaboration with the community and in particular with the peer navigator. After the workshop, we do a rapid point of care test and we collect blood samples in or dried blood spot samples. We then return to the site to provide the results. Now, if they're positive, we're going to need to link them to liver specialist care for follow-up um, assessment, and we'll be doing that in collaboration with the peer navigator. If they're negative, we're able to assess with the DBS if they still need a vaccine or if they've actually been vaccinated. If they need a vaccine, we return with a nurse and we vaccinate them on site at the community center. And the peer navigator plays a role throughout the entire process, helping those who are positive maybe go back to primary care for a follow-up 
vaccination for their booster or to the hospital for treatment, but also answering questions when we're not there about viral hepatitis. Here are some images from the launch last week and you see Camila Piccio, our, our coordinator, and Marcela Villota setting up in a Ghanaian community center in Barcelona. Um, here you see um, getting ready to, to start testing someone from the community. And then using a chair, we were drying the dried blood spots. Um, they have to dry for four hours, but we are able to put them in plastic, transport them, and then have them continue to dry. And here you see the research team. Now, back in 2017, when I presented the ESO International Liver Foundation's concept of micro elimination, we didn't think about including migrants in that population. So here you see the different populations that we prioritized, everyone from decompensated cirrhotics to patients with hemophilia, CKD, transplant patients, people who inject drugs, some of those, well, uh, of all of those populations, of course, will be migrants, but I would add particularly um, a new box here for migrant populations. And then within that migrant population, we need to further think about a breakdown microelimination to the particular migrant populations where there's a high prevalence of hepatitis B or C um, in the country or in, in the region. Ultimately, in order to know if we've eliminated or microeliminated um, hepatitis in a migrant population, we need to apply WHO's continuum of care or the cast or the, uh, the consensus cascade of care, which has fewer points and thus it's easier to collect all the data and comparable data. And we need to apply this to each migrant population. So in our case with HBV comme ça va, that would mean looking at the Ghanaian population or the Senegalese population, estimating how many are, in, are infected, how many are tested, aware of their status, enrolled in care, I would add vaccination um, into this process, how many have been started on treatment, if needed, retained on treatment, so on and so forth. This consensus, um, this, sorry, con a continuum of care is designed for hepatitis C, so we would adapt it for hepatitis B. Ultimately, I think we can eliminate viral hepatitis in migrant populations, but it will require understanding those populations, working closely with them, and making sure that we don't address migrants as one large population, like I'm doing in this presentation, but think about each, as we saw in the ECDC report, each of the populations that contributes to the prevalence in your particular setting. And let me acknowledge the full team, especially um, Camila from IS Global, who's coordinating the HPV Comes About project, and Elisa Martro, who provided our DBS training and is also working closely with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for uh, this. Uh, you always present uh, new concepts and uh, new ideas uh, for caring for uh, uh, patients with hepatitis. And uh, now uh, I would like to uh, start presenting the oral abstracts. Uh, the first uh, abstract uh, that will be presented uh, is a Challenge and Opportunity for HCV Elimination Among Young uh, Persons Who Are Injecting Drugs in New York City relatively low RNA seroconversion genetically linked HCV infections uh, by Pedro uh, Mathieu uh, Gillibert. Welcome everyone to the presentation titled Challenge and Opportunities for Hepatitis C Elimination Among Young People Who Inject Drugs in New York City. I will speak of our findings that indicate a relatively low RNA seroconversion and genetically linked hepatitis C infections. As most of you know, a new generation of young people who inject drugs face persistent viral threats to hepatitis C infection. Young people who inject drugs tend to associate and inject drugs mostly with other people their own age, despite the fact that a few, a smaller proportion interacts with older PWID. And beyond hepatitis C antibody prevalence, we need to know what is the chronic infection rate and understand hepatitis C transmission links. As part of an ongoing stage safe study, the behavioral intervention to prevent hepatitis C, we screen young opioid users ages 18 to 29 in New York City, most of whom were referred by peers. 
between February and December 2019, we screened and collected DBS from 387 young people who injured drugs. The screening procedures included age verification, hepatitis C antibody testing, and drug blood sample collection. DBS were sent to laboratory for RNA testing and GHOST phylogenetic analysis. GHOST stands for Global Hepatitis C Outbreak and Surveillance Technology. It's a CDC program that runs a phylogenetic analysis from samples throughout the US. Um, the results of the analysis um, indicated that 26% of the screenees, 101 from the 307 screen, were hepatitis C antibody positive, of whom 52% were RNA positive. 52 of those RNA samples were deemed viable for ghost phylogenetic analysis, and the results indicate a whole quarter, 27% of those RNA positive individuals were genetically linked. Four separate transmissions connected four pairs, one fifth transmission linked three individuals, and additionally, three individuals were genetically close to three of those four pairs. Uh, this is another way to look at the data. The overall screenings were 387. Of those, 26% were antibody pet positive, 13% were RNA positive, and 4% were uh, presented um, genetically linked infections. This is uh, the genotype distribution. 65% were 1A, 31% 3A, uh, and uh, one individual was 2A. And interestingly, another individual presented uh, all three genotypes, 1A, 1B, and 3A. Uh, this is uh, the Ghost network, you can see here the four pairs and these uh, three um, individual link um, network. And the phylogenetic tree is interesting in that indicates those links, uh, pairs, and the tree sum. But additionally, there are three individual linked to them genetically, but not close enough to indicate a direct link. In conclusion, uh, young PWID uh, of the sample in New York City, a quarter present chronic hep C infections that were genetically linked. Phylogenetic testing could provide critical understanding of hep C infections and identify hot spots among networks. And clearly our data indicates that expanding RNA testing and treating those with chronic infections could drastically reduce hep C incidence and transmission in this high risk population that could certainly lead to hepatitis C elimination. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And now we move to the second abstract presentation, cost effectiveness of expanding treatment with direct acting antiviral treatment to reduce uh, hepatitis C incidence among HIV infected MSMs in Thailand by uh, uh, Sri Yoshi uh, Mukherjee. Hi everyone, I'm going to be presenting the results of cost effectiveness modeling study on direct acting antivirals in Thailand. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Treatment of hepatitis C virus has undergone significant improvement with the introduction of direct acting antivirals that cure more than 95% of patients. These cured patients cannot transmit the virus onwards and therefore it is considered a treatment as prevention strategy. An emerging HCV epidemic has been observed among the HIV infected MSM in Thailand, wherein no new infections were seen before 2014 and that increased to an incidence rate of almost 5% by 2019. 
Although direct acting antivirals have been introduced in the country back in 2018, they're expensive. A 12 week regimen costs $450 in Thailand. So, to find out whether expanding DEAs as a treatment strategy was affordable for Thailand, we studied the epidemiological impact and we examined it through the trends on incidence and prevalence rates through 2030. And we also examined the economic impact of expanding DAAs by studying cost effectiveness in the long run. And in the short run, we conducted the impact, we studied the impact on the budget. To be able to conduct all of this analysis, we used a transmission model, which had been previously constructed using Dutch data, and we calibrated it to the Thai context. I'm presenting a very simplified version of the model here, and I'm happy to share more on the details of the model offline. So the model begins with people who are not infected by the virus, who upon getting infected can either clear the virus naturally, that happens 15 to 20% of the times, or they can move into the natural progression of the disease through the stages of fibrosis, um, and move into, uh, could develop cirrhosis and also could develop hepatocellular carcinoma. The base case scenario in our model was considered as metavir stage F2, which is when DAAs are introduced in Thailand as per the current HCV management guidelines. This was compared to a late treatment scenario at stage F1 and also an early treatment scenario, which was immediately after diagnosis of HCV. To share the results, the incidence rate per thousand person years of follow-up have been plotted on the vertical axis, whereas the horizontal axis plots all the years since the beginning of the epidemic in 2015 up until 2030, which is when the World Health Organization aims to eliminate the virus. And we see that a 40% decline in the incidence rate is observed when treatment is started immediately after diagnosis, as compared to the base case scenario, which has been plotted by the red dotted line. Um, the most favorable line is the green line, where we see a 40% decline. So to come to the cost effectiveness part of the results, we see that um, all, the, all the intervention scenarios have been, uh, have been enumerated in the first column. And in the base case scenario, which is represented in the last row, we see that $46 million would be accrued by the government over a period of 30 years with 3% discounting. if DAAs are continued to be administered at state F2, which is the base case scenario. And if the government decides to expand DAA strategy to stage F1, then they would save $5 million. Whereas if they uh, expand the treatment immediately after diagnosis, they would save $17 million. These high cost savings are, res are a result of the strong impact that direct acting antivirals have on the incidence rate. I also have results on um, the, the one-way sens sensitivity analysis, budget impact analysis, and also prevalence rate. And I can discuss that in more detail offline. So to come to the conclusion, DAA treatment strategy immediately after diagnosis not just saves costs, but also has substantial health benefits. And if the Thai government decides to expand the treatment by introducing DAAs immediately after diagnosis, we would contribute to the HCV elimination targets of 2030. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the rest of my co-authors who are from the Thai Red Cross HIV Research Center in Bangkok, the United States Military HIV Research Program in Seattle, and uh, my colleagues from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. Thank you. Uh, thank you for presenting this excellent model. And uh, now to the next presentation, uh, Missed Opportunities for HCV Elimination in Provincial Correctional Institutions in Ontario, Canada by uh, Paul Yudovsky. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Yudovsky, and I'm a Master of Public Health candidate at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I'll be presenting a study on HCV testing trends from correctional institutions in Ontario, Canada. To begin with some background, Canadian correctional facilities can be divided into two systems, the federal system and the provincial slash territorial systems. The federal system is involved in handling offenders with greater than or equal to two-year sentences, while the provincial system is responsible for those with less than two-year sentences. The offender population in Canada is of interest because they bear a disproportionate burden of HCV infection. 
the Public Health Agency of Canada, has estimated that in 2011, about 25% of individuals in federal or provincial custody were HCV antibody positive, a significantly higher figure than the general population. Federal institutions currently offer opt-in screening testing on admission, while in provincial institutions, testing is only offered upon request. There's currently little data available on how these differences in testing strategy has affected testing rates and the prevalence of positive tests between federal and provincial institutions. Our objective was to compare these patterns and types of HCV testing and results from federal and provincial correctional institutions and in the community in Ontario. For our methods, two administrative databases from Public Health Ontario laboratories were linked internally. Individuals were then classified based on their type of test, test result, and whether they were ever incarcerated, which is defined as tests that were ordered from a correctional institution, or never incarcerated, defined as tests that were ordered in the community. Based on the name of the facility for the EI group, individuals were also classified into federal or provincial categories. So overall, between 1999 and 2014 inclusive, there were roughly 1.7 million tests that were found in the data across 1,055,073 individuals. When split up between our two defined incarceration groups, 2.4% were classified as ever incarcerated, or EI, and 97.6% were classified as never incarcerated, or NI. In the provincial institutions, we saw a higher overall prevalence of HCV antibody tests compared to the federal institutions. As expected, the proportion is significantly lower in the community than in either of the correctional contexts. This table combines some of the information you saw previously in the flowchart. From the roughly 25,000 individuals in the EI group that had HCV antibody testing, 30.4% tested positive overall compared to 9.6% in the community. I would like to draw your attention here specifically to the final row, which shows the amount of follow-up confirmatory RNA testing completed as a proportion of all HCV antibody positive individuals. In the community, we have about 90% of all HCV antibody positive individuals receiving confirmatory testing, whereas in the federal and provincial contexts, we have about 85% and 61% respectively. So in this presentation, I will highlight the three main results. The first is that the rate of HCV positivity was higher in the provincial versus federal context. This may be because of the risk factor-based testing program in the provincial setting, resulting in higher positivity rates. However, we believe that relying solely on risk factors instead of universal screening may lead to missed opportunities of diagnosis and treatment. The second is that confirmation that HCV positivity is higher in the correctional setting than the community setting. This can be partially explained by the high prevalence of offenders with a history of injection drug use, which has been suggested to vary between 28 and 50%. The final discussion point we have is the varied rates of confirmatory follow-up RNA testing across all contexts. Federal and community contexts were fairly similar, but the provincial follow-up rate was lagging behind significantly, at around 61%. A potential explanation for this is the significantly shorter sentences in the provincial setting as the provincial setting only has offenders that have sentences of less than two years, resulting in loss to follow-up. In terms of our limitations, there was a high risk of misclassification between NI and EI groups, there's limited availability of testing from private laboratories, and finally, there was limited data on the linkage to care and treatment after diagnosis. Overall, this presentation was a brief highlight of the differences in HCV positivity and testing patterns between correctional settings and the community. We recommend future studies that explore barriers to HCV initial screening and confirmatory testing in correctional settings to allow for the optimization of testing policies, which can lead to the mitigation of disparity that exists in the correctional setting and expanded care that could lead to HCV elimination. I would like to first acknowledge my co-authors and also thank the Public Health Ontario Laboratory Information Management Technology Group and Public Health Ontario Kingston for our data sources, as well as Merck Canada for funding. I would also like to thank Biology Education and the IVHEM Organizing Committee for giving me the opportunity to share this research. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for your presentation. And now we're going to highlight another vulnerable population then by the next speaker, uh, PM uh, reductions of hepatitis C burden, Islamabad, Pakistan slums through CHW screen and three programs by Hassan Mahmoud. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Hassan Mahmood from Integral Global. Today I am going to present a SCV microelimination project that we are implementing in urban slums of Islamabad. The project is funded by John C. Martin Foundation and is implemented by Integral Global 
under the auspices of Federal Ministry of Health. Division of Viral Hepatitis of CDC USA are our technical partners. There are total 17 slums in Islamabad with a total population of 50,000. These are marginalized Christian community and they are daily wage earners, laborers. The project goals are to provide free screening, testing and treatment for HCV to all the individuals who are 12 years and above. We also increase awareness about Hep C infection in these slums and increasing hepatitis B vaccination. Moreover, we are verbally screening uh, for tuberculosis and referring potential cases to a public sector TB clinic for further testing and follow-up. We have hired four uh, community health workers from every community who are trained to screen people using WHO pre-qualified rapid testing kits, screening kits in these slums. The people who are NTACV positive, they are referred to a public health care facility that is officially designated by Federal Ministry of Health for the project. Their people are tested for ACV RNA using a gene expert machine that is provided by the federal government of Pakistan. Their APRI score is calculated and treatment is dispensed based on the APRI score. Patients are counseled to visit health facility three months after the end of treatment to check their sustained virologic response and who Soever achieved SVR, they are given a cure certificate. These are community workers. The data is recorded using a paper questionnaire and is entered into the Excel sheet. All the personal identifiers are masked to ensure the confidentiality and data is managed by Ministry of Health and Integral Global. CDC DVH is, uh, is analyzing this data sheet and share with us their analysis report on monthly basis. Now we are going to share our preliminary results. So far we have screened more than 11,000 individuals in 10 slums. NTHCV prevalence is 3.2%, 86% P individuals are tested for ACV RNA out of its 76% are ACV RNA positive. 98% have initiated treatment and 94% are tested for SVR out of which 95% are cured. Our community health workers are the strength of this project because they provide regular follow-up, high rates of adherence to care cascade, and they have reached a marginalized population. The preliminary conclusions of our projects are that we have some strengths, which are that we are providing a one-stop shop, that is testing and treatment is done on the same day. It is simple and it is free of charge for this underserved community. Furthermore, we are demonstrating a public-private model which is very sustainable because government of Pakistan is fully owning or, uh, you know, giving ownership to this project. However, there are certain limitations which include low education and lack of awareness among these people to understand the importance of screening that led to the refusal and loss to follow up. And also, of course, paper-based data entry but we are planning to shift to GIS mapping and to record data electronically using tablet. Next steps are to support Pakistani government in achieving national goal to eliminate hepatitis C by 2030 and to expand project to the rest of Islamabad city and replicate in other underserved settings. We are also adapting the project to address COVID-19 and other infectious diseases.
At the end, we are thankful to all our partners for their extended support in implementing this project. And thank you everyone for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. Uh, this uh, session is really uh, very rich in information and uh, a lot of experience and uh, lots of models uh, that can be adopted in different countries. Uh, and I will start the, the discussion for the first three speakers and I'm going to hear from them each separately. There are questions addressed to them and I have my own questions as well. Uh, there is a huge refugee population in the world. We know that uh, that's According to UNHCR, at least 65 million people are refugees, and at least 10 million of those are children. And I think this is uh, a major obstacle for elimination of hepatitis uh, by 2030. And I think it's very important what we listen today and what we heard today from uh, the first three speakers about the importance and the burden of disease in these uh, populations. Um, I would like to ask, and, and, and some of the, uh, those people attending also are asking the same question, how can those populations be integrated within uh, national strategies? Uh, what is the role of international organizations? Um, I would like to add also, uh, how can we work together in improving the health of those populations and improving testing? And how can we make diagnostics and uh, treatment uh, available at lower costs? Uh, what are the opportunities coming from uh, the COVID uh, for equipment, for diagnostic equipment, and whether we can invest on this for these uh, special populations, the Rohingya population in particular, they are stateless. Uh, I'm not sure they can be integrated within the uh, population of uh, Bangladesh. And, 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 and somebody was asking also, uh, what are the social and cultural barriers uh, for uh, the introduction and acceptability for the birth dose uh, vaccination in this population. So I, I would like to hear first from uh, 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 Professor Ali and then Ponciano and then uh, Jeff. And Jeff has lots of other questions as well. Can you unmute, please? Uh, yes. uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for this question. Is it really is a burning uh, uh, issue? And uh, uh, this question is a re really valid one because uh, this sudden um, appearance of this about 1 million people and then uh, they are uh, poor and uh, more main problem is uh, they are educationally also backward and they have got the uh, uh, that is this uh, health uh, careness is also less and uh, while well, they were staying this is the exception this Rohingya refugees because if some uh, some war worker or some other country was there. People, some normal uh, residents, people are coming to another country. But here, these people uh, are deprived from all kinds of facilities. I, I mentioned it in the first uh, word that they were denied the citizenship of uh, Myanmar in 1982. So they are staying there without, uh, they don't have uh, exact. Uh, Facilities, uh, their healthcare facilities that they are not getting from the uh, their own country, that is the Myanmar. So they are deprived in all ways, educationally backward, poor, and suddenly they appeared here. So working with them, when we went to them, we found a lot of problems. Problems uh, they don't like to come forward. They uh, they have got the uh, they don't have belief. Uh, about the testing and uh, other things, they think you know, last to be taken maybe for other things. So you must have to convince them, then this is good for you. So whatever this uh, problem, another thing is this, uh, when there is question of hepatitis B and C, control strategy come, comes three things, that the testing, diagnosis, and brought them under the, uh, that is the statement strategy. And it is completely different from a, a native country and to the migrant people. And here, Rohingya has a sudden influx of this large number of people staying in the hills, roadside, and this stuff, and having a highly infectious disease that is hepatitis C and B also high. So it is related with so many factors, devoting to their lifestyle, devoting to their healthcare, 
and this is the end of uh, so many years deprivation of all these facilities uh, in their own country. And they, now they are homeless, they are in the road, they are in the holes, and, uh, they don't have any address. So I think uh, to, con uh, and another thing is this, uh, uh, they are potentially danger for uh, they are uh, where they're staying in Nikoksi Bajar. They, uh, more than three times the population of native population, native population of the neighboring areas. And now another problem has come. There, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, international authorities knows that uh, uh, there is uh, unwillingness of the Myanmar to take them. So there is, uh, they are thinking that they, they will stay here, stay, uh, stay in Bangladesh. And they don't, uh, how, how long they will stay? And with this high health hazard situation, uh, uh, they, like, they are uh, entering uh, to Bangladesh uh, territory in different ways. And uh, Bangladesh has signed a uh, commitment for uh, elimination 2030 goal. So we are afraid since they are long staying in the highly infectious condition, particularly C among them, and they are going to jeopardize our um, host countries, uh, uh, that is the viral laboratory control study. Your second uh, question is how can we combat these things? Uh, definitely this uh, testing, diagnosing, scale up this, uh, bring them under treatment is the main strategy. And it should be a well-coordinated one. It should be locally based and should have you know, those uh, organizations, many organizations uh, headed by UNHCR and other countries are working for them. So whoever likes to help them needs a well-coordinated um, effort uh, and making a viral hepatitis control strategy. And uh, then only it could be successful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ponciano, uh, your point of view, and also I would like to hear from you whether the children are linked to care as well, because this is uh, an important issue so mothers who are HEP B positive, are you linking the children as well for follow-up and care? Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for the question. First of all, I think the situation in Uganda is a little bit different. Like I mentioned in the presentation, the, um, when the refugees actually get into the country, they eventually you know, get almost like incorporated into the the, into the country system. Uh, and they, so they are given land, they are given, they are free to move around a little bit. Um, in fact, not even a little bit, they're able to move in the country. Uh, but so the, the refugees are under the prime minister's office. But then their care in terms of healthcare is taken care of by, by the Ministry of Health of Uganda. So in the refugee camps, there are some basic uh, medical facilities that will take care of maternal uh, health care, uh, screening for malaria and treatment of malaria. Uh, but screening for hepatitis uh, B and C has not been done routinely, not even in the government system. And so it is the same system. Um, we haven't started uh, birth doors in the country at all, although now we are at a high level of negotiations uh, with the ministry, uh, which, and I, I believe that soon this is going to start. And when it starts, the health units within the refugee set, settlement camps will also be included in this. And uh, so we are really hoping that eventually uh, the refugees will, will join the, 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 the rest of the countries in terms of how they are being taken care of. Uh, otherwise, um, they, when, we screen, when we screened the mothers, uh, we actually then uh, sent them to the um, district hospital, government district. 
And that's where they were being, they are being taken. That's where they are being delivered by the healthcare workers within the district hospitals. Uh, sometimes when it is an advanced case, these uh, refugees are sent actually to the national referral hospitals where they are taken care of as well. And uh, so in Uganda, the situation is a little bit different and we hope that it doesn't change for the worse. But what is not being done in the country for the population is also not being done in the refugee settlement. So that is really what I could say uh, about the situation in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff, uh, the, the same question, but also I'm going to add because uh, somebody asked about monitoring for sustained virological response by uh, DBS, uh, whether you're using it. And uh, I would like to ask you about how you link, how are you linking uh, those to specialist care in, in Barcelona? Is it by telemedicine or you're using other means? Uh, I agree with you that uh, on-site uh, services are the most important uh, to offer for the migrant population. And maybe we can try and lead a sort of a task force or a consortium for refugees in different countries. Uh, but I would like to hear from you, what are your concepts of linking uh, to the specialist care as well as the use of DBS. Great, thank you very much, Manal, and thank you to those who posed questions. So to answer your first question about Europe and how to engage migrants and refugees, well, Europe needs to make sure, particularly for migrants, because refugees have often particular status, needs to make sure that if you're in Europe, universal health coverage is extended to you, and therefore you would also have the opportunity to be tested and treated for, for hepatitis B or C. So that's often not the case, particularly for those in irregular situations, those who are undocumented. That's different in, in Catalonia. So if we, and this already happened last week, if we test someone and they inform us that they actually don't have a, a health card, the Catalan government has provided us with cards and we can give them a card so that they have free health care for an entire year. That's a great incentive to get tested for hepatitis. It's a great way to keep your population healthy because if in the end they do get sick, not necessarily from hepatitis, they will end up in the health system. So this is a great way to, to link them in. So, so we're incredibly excited that our project has gone beyond hepatitis and actually starts to bring migrants into the health system, linking them to the general practitioner system as well. Um, you asked about the role of international organizations. Um, International organizations need to continue to identify migrants and refugees as specific key populations, marginalized, vulnerable, that need specific attention, particularly those coming from endemic um, populations. So just as with microelimination, we didn't list uh, migrants when we first considered the, the, that option for hepatitis C. Now all international organizations, we all need to consider migrants and break that population even further down because obviously I mean, I'm a migrant too. I moved to, to Europe 20 years ago. So we need to, we need to focus on, on, on certain groups of migrants who need special attention. In terms of DBS, so in our project in Barcelona, we're really focusing on, on hepatitis B. So, so we wouldn't be going back to, to, to test for SVR. And the question related to how do we link the population to specialist care? So we're working closely with, with two doctors at two leading university hospitals in Barcelona, their hepatology departments. And we're really relying on, on the peer navigators. So if someone tests positive, when we go back with the results, the peer navigator team takes over and the hospitals have allowed for sort of a fast track clinic approach on a certain day, the peer navigator arrives with the person who tested positive, they will go right through the system and, and be seen for care without a prior appointment. So it's really been an incredible collaboration between large hospitals and the migrant um, community, in this case, in Ghana and Senegal themselves. Yeah, I think that's an excellent model that can be replicated in, in, in other areas. But do you see also any opportunities coming from COVID for equipment, especially in diagnostics for this population? Yeah, we see the opportunity to essentially tandem test because if we're going to eliminate COVID-19 in Europe, we need to move to the communities. Right now, we're, we're requiring people to go typically to hospitals and clinics, sometimes to, to field settings and intense even in major cities to get tested but we need to start taking 
the services to them. So in Copenhagen, in the test and treat, the TNT Copenhagen, that's led by the, the Users Academy, a, a community-based group of people who inject drugs, they test for COVID-19 and they test for hepatitis C at the same time. So through some of the funding that's been provided for COVID, they're able to you know, hire people, include vol more volunteers and, and go and reach the people who inject drugs who are completely you know, outside of their, their formal health system. Thank you, Jeff. I, I have a I have a question also for the for abstract presenter uh, Pedro. Uh, are you also considering testing the younger uh, persons who are injecting drugs, those aged 15 to to 18? Because I think I think your uh, population is 18 and above. Yeah, um, in, this is uh, based on a randomized controlled trial sample. Uh, young people who inject drugs in New York City ages 18 to 29, which is our sample, are hard to reach. So um, I think basically the recommendation uh, driven by the data is that if we focus on young PWID, young people who inject drugs in New York City, who in my opinion, and I have written about this, are a semi-autonomous group of older people who inject drugs which have higher prevalence. So if we were to focus on that group with surveillance on antibody, RNA, and treat that relatively low percentage, around 13% who are hepatitis C positive, I do think in the context of New York City with, um, with the support of the, the network and meal exchange programs that we could target those 15% positive, provide them treatment. We have proven in another study that pre, uh, uh, treatment of hepatitis C annual change program can be very successful. And by, by addressing that relatively low 13% of chronically infected, we will do uh, accomplish two things. A, addressing the immediate hep C infection among those infected. And equally important, given that they are semi-autonomous, we will prevent further infection within the injection network. Our phylogenetic analysis indicated that around a quarter of the infections among young, young people are actually interrelated to that network, a quarter. It's, it's a very large percentage. So by treating the young people we could microeliminate among this high prevalence group and we could prevent further infection. Thank you very much. I totally agree. And, and I think also uh, some of them get pregnant and they also transmit infections to their babies. So it's very important uh, to eliminate as early as possible. Uh, there's also a question for Thailand. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the question is coming on the chat box. Uh, we understand that uh, Thailand is already committed uh, to HCV treatment at no costs to all patients. So uh, I will need a comment from the second abstract presenter. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Well, it is true. Um, Thailand does provide a universal health care, so uh, patients do not have to pay for it, but somebody does. And that somebody is the government, uh, which will have to pay for it. And that's why I think uh, uh, the study provides strong implications for the kind of costs that the, uh, that the government will have to bear to manage the disease burden among this high-risk population group. Um, so, and that's what the results showed that uh, with the current implementation protocol, which is prevalent in Thailand, that is, if direct acting antivirals, which cure and which treat uh, hepatitis C so uh, effectively. Um, if they are given at a later stage, it, it will uh, it'll cost the government about $46 million in the long term, whereas the government will be able to save almost 40%, will be able to cut 40% of those costs if they, if, they, um, if they start the DEA treatment immediately after diagnosis. So that's, that's that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for for Paul. Uh, do you do you know uh, the what's the impact of the COVID nineteen on your programs for the incarcerated? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, for yeah, the impact of COVID nineteen currently, uh, 
I'm not exactly sure about how it has impacted uh, the particular like incarcerated population. Uh, what I am aware though, is that there is less of an opportunity for, um, for clinician visits and that has impacted the ability to uh, test for the uh, HCV. So um, in that sense, uh, individuals can only uh, have contact with a physician through uh, telemedicine. So physicians aren't going into uh, the correctional uh, environments anymore. So at this point, there's a limited opportunity to have a direct contact with patients and that's uh, like limited over time as well. Okay, thank you. So, so the, uh, for, the, for the last speakers, uh, for the last speaker in Pakistan, if one member of uh, the household was found HCV positive, uh, are the other members offered uh, the same test? And the, the, the other question is, uh, what are the prospects of sustainability? And I think this question goes to all uh, speakers, the sustainability of such programs in the vulnerable populations. I think this is a very important question. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, as I said that we are implementing a community outreach model where community health workers, they go in the slums and they screen people at their doorsteps. So every household, regardless, regardless they are uh, anti-ACV positive or negative, they are screened for anti-ACV. So um, that's the thing, every person uh, is screened for anti-ACV. And as far as sustainability is concerned, our model is very much sustained because we are implementing this project in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Health. I mean, it's not a standalone project. The health facility uh, on which we have established the project testing and treatment site, that is a government public health care facility. And moreover, the staff, the healthcare workers who are working at that facility, they are also trained on hepatitis screening, testing, and treatment. So if we move out, uh, the government will take over and it will be a sustainable project. So did you, did you screen any children and are you treating children as well in this program? Yes, we are screening everyone aged 12 years or above. Uh, so far we have screened 1,200 uh, adolescents who are between 12 and 17 years. And we have found only one uh, uh, individual or one uh, kid who was NTACV positive between 12 and 17 years. Are you considering screening the younger ones, especially if the mothers are infected for mother to child transmission? Uh, not at the moment, uh, Chair, because our national guidelines and WHO guidelines, they say that every person uh, should be screened who is age 12 or above. So we are following those guidelines. So as far as new guidelines comes and uh, they, they encourage to screen the lesser age uh, population, we will definitely include that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you. I think there is a final question for uh, Professor Ali. Um, there is also uh, a question about the use of gene experts uh, for viral load. Professor Ali? Okay, so uh, uh, there is one for oh, Jeff, do you think? Oh, yes, okay, he's here. Yeah. So did you uh, use Gene Expert? Uh, not yet, not yet. Uh, uh, not yet. We are, particularly for the Rohingya people, we are not doing this. So uh, I think there is another one that came in for Jeff. Uh, do you think that offering tests for hepatitis to patients with COVID-19 can help? Uh, well, well, so well, I certainly do, but I realize it's, it's a major logistical issue. And at the moment, we can barely offer COVID-19 tests for people with COVID-19. So I, I do understand that we need to prioritize getting that pandemic under control. But in settings where it is more under control in certain parts of Europe, we should certainly consider how to tandem test, um, if we can start moving into self-testing, where there's rapid antigen testing, we can raise awareness, but then that would beg the question of, should it just be hepatitis or, or should it be um, you know, other infections as well? So we really need to you know, yeah. use the COVID-19 pandemic to start thinking of a treat the person, not the, not the disease approach. So, so you mentioned the quick and the, the recent study about quick and a correlation with viral load. And, and I've seen this very clearly in a study I hope I can publish soon in the immune suppressed population of children. 
um, who some of them had were antibody negative but were positive by aura quick and they had very high viral loads. So I think that's very uh, plausible. But what's your dream point of care test for uh, these uh, vulnerable populations? Well, obviously a rapid diagnostic is 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 ideal. The dream the dream test would be that with the aura quick, if you're positive within five minutes, and therefore, you know, and by remic that um that we can simply um, you know, and 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 end the discussion there. But I think DBS still um, where we're able to go back to the community is ideal because if you have enough blood spots, you can then test for for more than just for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Thank you very much. Uh, any last comments from the panelists? No? Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent, uh, brilliant session. I really enjoyed it and uh, I hope we can take this further into, uh, into action on the ground. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we have a, a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back to the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you.